Welcome back to Tariq Amba podcast and videocast. I'm your host, Solomon Cabrillé. In the last episode, we talked about the successors of Ikono Amlak, the early Solomonic Restoration period monarchs. Today, we will discuss one of Ethiopia's most consequential emperors, Emperor Amdiz Ion I. Historian Edward Ullendorf said of him, Amdiz Ion was one of the most outstanding Ethiopian kings of any age. This is part one of the saga that was the reign of Amdiz Ion. Emperor Amdiz Ion I ascended to the imperial throne in 1314 upon the death of Emperor Widmrad. He took the additional throne name of Gebra Meskad, or Servant of the Cross. Officially, he was listed as the son of Wudim Ra'ad and grandson of Yukonu Amlak. More on that interesting topic later. Amdiz Ion's first acts was to order that the histories of all the emperors of Ethiopia be compiled and that the events of his own reign be recorded and included in these chronicles along with those of his successors in the future. It will be recalled that there was evidence that Emperor Wudim Ra'ad had ordered the same. However, it is unknown whether Amdiz Ion continued his father's effort and just took the credit for it, or if Wudim Ra'ad's efforts had failed and Amdiz Ion restarted them. Either way, it is Amdiz Ion I who is credited in history with ordering the recording of the reigns of Ethiopian monarchs in its royal chronicles. For centuries, the Aksumite emperors had kept such chronicles. However, in an age of handwritten manuscripts when creating such books was a long and difficult process, way before the printing press made copying books easier, there were very few copies of these chronicles made. In her zeal to destroy every trace of Aksumite civilization, Yodit Gudit was able to easily destroy every one of these chronicles quite quickly. The Zagwes apparently didn't see the need for a formal chronicle, and it appears that inter Zagwe rivalries caused reigning emperors to make no effort in preserving the acts of their predecessors. So instead, the histories of past monarchs and their times were being passed down in oral histories and in the gadals or hagiographies of certain saints. Obviously, passing down oral histories was not ideal, as stories may change slightly with each telling, and after several generations might no longer be particularly accurate. Yet, undoubtedly, these oral histories were for the most part based on real people and events and thus had real historical value. Amdiz Ion had these histories collected from various knowledgeable people and written down by a group of scribes. These scribes, or Tzahafis, were under the authority of a special royal appointee. This official was given the title of Azaj, which means commander or administrator, and appointed as Tzahafi Izaz of Emperor Amdiz Ion, or scribe by command of Emperor Amdiz Ion. At that time, and through the next couple of reigns, the title of the holder was Azaj, while Tzahafi Izaz was the name of the job itself. Eventually, though, Tzahafi Izaz became both the title and the job. This official was also the person responsible for issuing laws, proclamations, and communications of all kinds on behalf of the emperor, and recording the customs and rituals of his court. As such, he had possession of the emperor's seal. Thus, the holder of this office became one of the most powerful officials of the imperial court. Much later, in the 19th and 20th centuries, when the imperial government was modernized and set up as a cabinet of ministers, the Tzahafi Izaz was placed at the head of the Ministry of the Pen, and in the reign of Emperor Haile Selassie was held by men generally regarded as the most powerful and influential people in the country after the monarch himself. The title of Tzahafi Izaz, like most Ethiopian titles, was for life and remained the person's title even after he left the actual position, unless he was appointed to a higher ranking title. We will discuss Ethiopian titles in a separate episode. Emperor Amdiz Ion I Sahafi to Izaz presided not only over the writing down of the Chronicle of the Aksumite Kings, but participated in the formal introduction of the book Kibra Negast, or Glory of Kings, as the official declaration and confirmation of the legitimacy of the House of Solomon on the throne of Ethiopia. This book recounts the visit of Makada, Queen of Sheba, to King Solomon, and her return to her kingdom pregnant with Solomon's child Minelik. Minelik I would be crowned as Ethiopia's first emperor and establish the House of Solomon on the throne. 
This book of the imperial dynasty's beginnings is said to have originally been written in Arabic and brought to Ethiopia from Alexandria, Egypt, during the reign of Emperor Lalibela. However, it had never been translated and left largely ignored by the Zagwes. At this point, during the reign of Amdetsion, Yishak, the Nibra'id of Aksum, consulted with the Shum or governor of Tigray, Ya'abeka Igzi, and together with a scholar named Neymurhanaab, translated this work into Ge'ez. Now, certain Western historians like Count Rossini and René Bassett have discounted the story as an invention designed to give ancient legitimacy to a young dynasty. They both conclude, with their private opinions, that Nubra ed Yishak created and wrote down the legend himself and made up the story that it was an Arabic book brought from Alexandria, once the location of a massive historic library and the seat of the patriarch himself. It is another instance of scholars discounting things that they find to be too fantastic. However, Ethiopian historian Teklis Adik Mokria questions their dismissal with some compelling evidence. He notes that the book refers repeatedly to Ibn Hakim for son of the wise. This is an Arabic phrase, not Ge'ez, which would have been translated to Waldet Abib. It would seem it was kept in its original Arabic for a reason. Indeed, there are other Arabic phrases and words preserved in the Ge'ez version, which indicates an earlier Arabic version. So the dismissal of the account that this was an ancient work brought from Egypt should itself be taken with a grain of salt. A little explanation about Nubra Id Yisak's title. The title of Nubra Id means placing hands upon and is a title reserved for the cleric who acted as administrator of the St. Mary of Zion Cathedral and Monastery, as well as the governor of the Aksum district. It was a very senior rank in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, as well as the imperial court. If the title of Nubra Id was granted with the right to wear a coronet, referred to as Warg Masar, then the Nubra Id enjoyed the rank of Aras, which is roughly equivalent to a duke in the West. If no coronet was granted, he was accorded the courtesies due to a Dejazmach, which is roughly equivalent to an earl. The Nubra Id was among the monastic heads who had a direct participatory role in the coronations of the emperors of Ethiopia. In the early 20th century, Minlik II built a new monastery church dedicated to St. Mary of Zion at Addis Alam in western Shah and granted the title of Nubra'id to the administrator of that monastery too. However, the Nubra'id of Aksum was given precedence over the Nubra'id of Addis Adam, and the Nubra'id of Addis Adam did not enjoy the rank of Arras even if he were granted the right to a coronet. We now come to one of the more salacious episodes in Ethiopian history. Amdes Yon was about to get into an epic clash with the senior clergy of the Orthodox Church over his personal conduct. Now, what might come as a surprise to many of us is the polygamous practices of the Christian emperors of these times. Amdes Yon and several of his successors had more than one wife and several official concubines in violation of the monogamy preached by the Christian church. Indeed, it had become customary to have at least two declared queens, with Zerayagob possibly having a third. The two queens held the titles of Gra Baaltihat and Keng Baaltihat, which means the left queen and the right queen. The Gra Baaltihat being the senior queen. In Zerayakob's case, his third queen was titled Baalta Shehona. The idea of a Christian practicing polygamy clearly goes against the doctrines of the Orthodox Church, but one can see how the emperors of that age fell into the practice. They were surrounded by states which in both Muslim and polytheistic societies, rulers regularly practiced polygamy and kept harems. In their desire to strengthen their dynasties and secure the succession to their thrones, having children, not just with a couple of wives, but with multiple concubines, probably seemed to be the pragmatic thing to do. Now, if we look at the history of Christian monarchies around the world, we find that there are many other examples of kings who were married to official queens, yet who kept official mistresses to whom they granted great titles and wealth and ennobled children born of these relationships. 
Generally, these European Christian ladies were referred to as mistresses and not concubines, but their statuses were not dissimilar to their Ethiopian Christian counterparts. Henri II of France went so far as to have his mistress, Diane de Poitiers, preside over his court as if she was his official consort, while his real wife, Queen Catherine de' Medici, remained in the background, emerging as a formidable power only after her husband died during the reigns of her three sons. Later, Louis XIV of France not only ennobled his children by his different mistresses, but even legitimized them by edict. Charles II, James II, and other kings of England and Scotland ennobled their illegitimate descendants as well, but didn't legitimize them. Not many people know that recent former British Prime Minister David Cameron is a direct descendant of King William IV, the uncle and predecessor of Queen Victoria, in an illegitimate but recognized line, making him a fifth cousin to Queen Elizabeth II, whom he served as Prime Minister. So the existence of extramarital relationships which enjoyed official recognition and high status, call them mistresses or concubines, was not unusual in the Christian world, even though it was considered adulterous and sinful. The significant difference between the statuses of European royal mistresses and the Ethiopian imperial concubines was that while the children of a European mistress could expect to inherit great titles and wealth, they almost never were allowed to inherit thrones of their fathers. In Ethiopia, the son of a concubine had no such restriction and had as good a chance of inheriting the throne as a legitimate heir. What was very different were the multiple wives, and this was a point of contention between the church and the crown for a long time. Yet even this was not the source of the salacious matter that caused such tumult between the emperor and the church. The Coptic Archbishop of Ethiopia at this time was Abu Nayagob, a man who carried out his duties of spreading the gospel and ordaining clergy and consecrating churches with great zeal. However, like many other of his predecessors and successors, he found the great distances he needed to travel to do his job to be a great challenge. Therefore, he decided to appoint Ejeki Philippos, abbot of Debra Azbo, later renamed Debra Libanos Monastery, to an episcopal role allowing him to carry out these functions in Shah and its neighboring territories to the south and east. Ejeki Philippos, in turn, appointed 11 prelates to evangelize various districts within this area and became extremely influential among the clergy and the public. Ejeki Philippos learned something about the emperor's personal life beyond the multiple wives and concubines that he found so shocking that he felt it warranted an intervention. Now, what the shocking information was is somewhat disputed now. Most accounts say that Amdesion had taken one of his father's wives or concubines as his own wife or concubine. Other accounts say he slept with his own sister or that he committed adultery with the sister of one of his wives. Whatever it was, it was so shocking that the clergy could not simply look on with disapproval as they had with the polygamy and the concubines. Most sources, including the Giz Chronicles, seem to lean towards the theory that Amdes Yon married one of his father's concubines. Echegi Filippos led a delegation of clerics which included Abba Anorios of Sagaga, Tutoglet, and the emperor's court to inquire as to the truth of what they had heard and to reprove him if it was true courteously and asked them what brought them to court. They reportedly asked if there was truth to the stories that they had heard that he had married his father's wife or concubine. The emperor is said to have asked what sin could there be in marrying his father's wife who was not his mother. He added that clerics as learned as they were had in fact told him that if he married his father's widow, his kingdom would be strengthened and his enemies obliterated. Echegi Filippos took exception to this and began to argue with the emperor very vigorously in front of his entire court. Tempers rose on both sides as they hardened their positions. In fact, Abba Anorios angrily scolded Amdesion in front of his court and the emperor felt he could not let such a public challenge go. He ordered that Abba Anorios be taken out and publicly flogged for his insolence towards God's anointed monarch. The monk was dragged from marketplace to marketplace and publicly flogged for insolence towards the emperor. But rather than meekly endure the savage punishment, Abba Anorius shouted out anathemas against Emperor Amdesion and heaped scorn upon him. This public spectacle shocked the general public 
and horrified the clergy, especially those who had come with Echeque Filippos. Then, late that evening, a fire broke out in the town that consumed a big portion of the city. Immediately, rumors spread that the fire was caused by God's anger that the emperor had flogged a holy monk, and that the blood spilled from the back of Abba Honorius had exacted divine retribution by igniting the town. The emperor and his loyalists, however, spread a counter-tale that it was in fact Echeque Filippos and his followers who had set fire to the town in revenge for the punishment that Abba Honorius received, a punishment that any insolent person who dared insult God's anointed could expect. Why did the senior clergy believe they were above the expectations of society, and why would they cause the suffering of the people by burning the city in the middle of the night? A little more about Abba Honorius of Zagaga. Abba Honorius was born into a clerical family that had blood ties to Kono Amlak and also to Saint Tekla Haimanut. His name at birth was Nardus, a name that can be used for both males and females, and his mother was named Christos Zemeda and was the sister of Abba Zena Marcos, a great abbot and saint. His father was named Kassis or Priest Salama. Anorius's maternal uncle is on record as having been the son of Deborah, twin sister of Emperor Ikono Amlak. If Christos Zemeda was Zena Marcos's full sister, then that would make Anorius a cousin to Emperor Amdas Ion and of imperial blood, which might explain his lack of awe for the emperor and his daring in publicly calling him out, so to speak. Abba Anorius had served at the Devra Atzbo Monastery under Abba Teglahamanot as the archdeacon and probably got his new name of Anorius at that point. He is credited with convincing Abba Teglahamanot to separate the men's monastery at Devra Atzbo from the women's convent there. He was elevated to the priesthood and continued to serve the monastery until the death of Abba Teklahamanut, upon which he left Devrazbo and went to Za'ad Amba to serve under Abba Bezalotemikael. However, Abba Bezalotemikael died not long after Abba Anorius had arrived at Za'ad Amba, so Anorius returned to Devrazbo. He returned to find the new abbot, Ejegi Filippos, in charge. As stated earlier, when the new bishop, Abuneyago, granted Ejegi Filippos episcopal authority, Ejegi Filippos appointed 11 prelates over districts of Shoah and neighboring territories to evangelize them and assist him in running the churches there. This was probably the most aggressive effort at evangelizing new areas since the nine saints of the Aksumite period. Abba Anorius was granted an area called Wadab. He would eventually be buried at Wadab and is sometimes referred to as Abba Anorius of Wadab. He was also invited by the faithful of Zagaga, not far from the modern city of Desi, to establish a monastery there which is why he is referred to as Abba Anorius of Zagaga. Abba Anorius would continue to be a thorn in the side of the powers that be and a truth teller into the next reign, but more about that in future episodes. Amdes Yun, threatened with excommunication over the affair, is said in some sources, to have claimed that his actual father was not Emperor Wudimrad, but his cousin, Emperor Kudma Asgid, making his marriage to Wudimrad's concubine a non-issue. Somehow, the idea of calling his own paternity into question, even if it was to another emperor, does not seem like something a monarch with numerous dynastic rivals would do, even though they were all locked away on Ambagishan. The senior wife of Emperor Amdesun was named Jan Mogasa, and it is her that is usually identified as the former concubine of his father, Udmrad. There is a record of a gift to the monastery of Debrebizan, in modern-day Eritrea, from a wife of Amdesun named Blin Saba. Whether this is another name for Empress Jan Mogasa, or if this is the name of his junior queen, is not certain. Empresses, like emperors, had separate personal and reign names. Clearly, each side in the dispute between the emperor and the clergy had its supporters, but the emperor had the upper hand. Emperor Amdesun ordered Echege Filippos and his followers exiled from Devara Atzvo. The Echege and his loyal monks left Shawa and went initially to Ambagishan before moving on to what is now Tigray and Eritrea. While there, he continued to ordain clergy, including several future saints like Abbate Kastabrhan of Devrez Othan, Abbaze Johannes of Kivran, Abbate Alpha of Dima, and others. Echeke Abba Filippos would also be venerated and memorialized as an example of firm moral principles and speaking truth to power. 
Hamdus Yun's reign would be marked by significant deterioration in relations with the Muslim world, particularly with the Ifat Sultanate and several other sultanates which had been paying homage and taxes to the Ethiopian crown but were now growing restive. They may have been encouraged into rebellion by the Mamluk Sultan of Egypt, An Nasr Muhammad ibn Alahun. According to Richard Pankhurst in his book, The Ethiopian Borderlands, Essays in Regional History from Ancient Times to the End of the 18th Century, Sultan Alahun had increased the persecution of Coptic Christians and destroyed numerous churches in Egypt. In 1321, a diplomatic mission from Imperam Desion arrived in Cairo to warn Sultan Alahun to cease his persecution of Christians. He reminded the Sultan that just as he had made the Christians of Egypt suffer, Amdes Ion could persecute his many Muslim subjects. He underlined that he treated his Muslim subjects fairly, but that it would change if Golahun continued to cause suffering to the Copts. He also added that he would divert the course of the Nile and let Egypt starve. Richard Pankert states that while this last threat was beyond the emperor's capabilities technologically, and that the Sultan probably realized it, Fear that the Ethiopians might tamper with the Nile would remain in the minds of Egyptians for many centuries. The Sultan dismissed the Ethiopian embassy and Egypt then began to actively encourage the Muslim principalities to rebel against the Emperor Amdes Yun. When people say history repeats itself, one only needs to look at today's headlines about the bitter dispute between Ethiopia and Egypt over the new Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam and the rise of rebels in Ethiopia allegedly egged on by Egypt. It is indeed a case of deja vu. In the next episode of Tarikamba, we will talk about Amdits Yun's deteriorating relations with the subsidiary Muslim princes within his empire and the wars that resulted from this fateful confrontation with Mamluk Egypt. Until then, please subscribe to this channel, like and comment on our videos, follow us on social media, and look for additional materials and information on our website, tarikamba.com. You can also send your comments and questions to me directly via email to solomon at tarikamba.com. Until next time, be well.